So yeah, I'm Tom. I work for Catalyst IT. I have a new shirt that they gave me at lunchtime. Um, and I'm a Python developer by trade, but really just a hobbyist programmer because writing code is fun. Um, I'm not, as Chris may have mentioned, I'm not a penetration tester and I'm not a security professional, but a lot of my buddies are and um, some of my former colleagues penetration test my projects and it's a bit of a matter of personal pride that I at least make life a little hard for them. So I'm pretty interested in security stuff in general. Um, if you are an IT security professional, you already know everything I'm gonna go through. It's actually not that advanced. It's, it's kind of basic stuff, but it's basic stuff that gets forgotten. Are there any people here who are security professionals? Consider that, oh yeah, Mr. Jim over here. Um, so what you, what you can do is sit and look smug through my entire talk and, well, and help spread the word to developers like myself who get caught out by this sort of thing. The problem is that these mistakes just keep getting made, so I'm gonna keep shouting about it until we, we people like me, stop doing them. Um, welcome. Just give people a second. Cool. Run, run. Um, so I'm talking about serialization formats. I originally called this talk markup languages, but that's not really quite the right term, but it's the term that people use. Um, I will be talking about YAML and XML in this talk, but the issues that I'm gonna be discussing are fairly pervasive throughout all of computing, and you have far worse problems if you're a Java developer, uh, but I'm not going into that today. Just be vaguely paranoid, and if you use something called struts, be even more paranoid. Um, there are security professionals just, you, you say the word to them and they kind of laugh and cry at the same time. It's actually quite fun to do. It's, you do it in public and you see who are security professionals. So I was working on a project where there was a non-functional requirement that, that it have mitigation techniques in place for the OWASP top 10. Who here is familiar with the OWASP top 10? Is. is. Cool, either way. Um, if you're not familiar with the OWASP top 10 and you are a web developer, there's no real polite way of saying it. You're a liability to your project. So if you're not familiar with OWASP top 10, Google it now and read it instead of paying attention to me because it's more important. Uh, and it's also quick and easy to learn. So I did my project. I, uh, developed mitigations for the OWASP top 10, most of which I got for free because I was using Django, some of which you never get for free and you just have to watch out for, like configuration problems and... Could you spell OWASP top 10? O-W-A-S-P. Cool. Uh, come see me later and we can chat about it, Zane. Um, so my project got pen tested by Mike Howarth from Aura Security. And I realized that I had a lot more than that OWASP top 10 to worry about because he's an expert in some of the things that aren't on that list. And I went to see a talk by him about some of the stuff that I'll be showing off here. And it scared the crap out of me. And I went back to work after having a couple drinks and going to his talk and tried some of it out on my project and managed to DOS my site super, super easily, which was kind of depressing. Um, the number one rule of security is the person attacking your site really just needs to know one thing you didn't know when you wrote, when you wrote your code. Writing an insecure site isn't about being lazy, it's about not realizing that what you're doing could be harmful. SQL injection, that's exactly what that is. It's, you didn't realize, and it, you didn't, you're not necessarily gonna come up with that on your own, but once someone tells you about SQL injection, then you'll be a lot more careful in the future. And it is about features, not bugs. Again, it's not laziness and it's not incompetence that causes this stuff. Everything that I'm talking about today is a feature of the markup language that I'm talking about. None of this is bugs. This is all designed in because the people who designed the markup languages decided it was a great idea to do. Okay, can everyone read this all right? Who, who reads Python in general? Cool, okay, so if you read Python, this is pretty straightforward, and if you don't read Python, it's still really straightforward. 
This is a tiny little bottle web app. And it was just the practice code that I wrote when I was doing the research for this talk, when I was just fooling around. And all it does is it has three little endpoints that you send an HTTP post to with either XML or YAML. And all it does is parse it and then return it as a response. That's, that's really all it's doing. Now, the thing that's interesting here, where's my mouse? I am doing the lazy programmer's thing. I am doing the absolute bare minimum to just go from data to, or go from text to data. Because as a developer, importing data into your program is the least interesting part of your day. It's the last thing you want to be doing. You want to get it done right away because you want to be playing with the data. So to read YAML, you import the YAML library from Python. And then you go yaml.load, and then whatever it is you wanted to parse. Okay? So, and you would do that. It, it, looks, it looks like it's perfectly sane. YAML dot, you're probably using an autocomplete editor. So you'll hit tab and you'll go ll load. Hey, load. YAML dot load. Hey, it takes a thing. I'm done. I can move on with my day. The same deal with the XML stuff. You import the XML library and then you would just do the parsing. It's the lowest barrier to entry that you would ever do. Now, I'm, I've got two XML parsers here just because I'm demonstrating uh, a couple of different things, but LXML, for those who are not familiar with Python, is the external third-party XML library that everyone recommends you use. And XML on its own, uh, the other one down here, is the Python standard library XML parser, which is crap anyway, and everyone knows to not use. They should use LXML anyway. But people do use it because LXML is another dependency to their project. Anyway, XML is later. I'm going to play around with YAML first. YAML's been around since 2001, and it's really popular in Python and Ruby and probably non-existent in most other things. Ruby, uh, Perl developers use it a lot, but it's probably too hip for Java. Um, <laughs> is it used in PHP much? YAML? As JSON. As JSON. YAML in JSON? No, YAML. Uh, JSON is YAML. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. That's cool. Um, it pretends to be a human readable serialization format. It, it, it's been designed to be as readable as possible, and it can be. OK, can people read th this text reasonably well? OK, so I have a bunch of slides that look like this. And that's just, those are just line numbers there. And that is a piece of YAML. And YAML, in its most basic form, is just key value pairs. And because I'm using Python, my parsed response at the end is a Python dictionary. So again, if you're a, if you're a Python developer, that immediately makes sense to you. That's the YAML you get in, and that's the Python result of parsing it. And YAML has a lot of basic data types. Uh, this is just demonstrating the simple key value, key value pairs, which get mapped to a dictionary that you can then do whatever you want. Everyone's with me so far. Everyone gets what's going on there. So YAML has a lot of extensions to its language. There's a lot of features of YAML that aren't necessarily obvious right off the bat. What I'm doing here, as before, I've got basic key value pairs. And then the value here has a special tag to it telling you that this is a Python date object. And what it does is it goes to the date time module and goes to the date class. And it instantiates it using those three arguments. So if you use yaml.load, it will load the datetime.date module, pass in that, and what you get is the January 1st, 1980, just as a Python object. Now, the Python YAML library is helpful. It will import whatever library you've asked for there, and it will call the class constructor with whatever arguments you've given it. Uh, has a shiver gone down anyone's spine yet? Yeah. Cool. So <laughs> this is exactly the same thing. It's saying, hey, this is a Python object, and I just want you to apply to this function, the subprocess module, and this little thing called check output, and just pass it ls. And what you get in response is the output of the shell command ls. So yaml.load by default just automatically you know, it, it, it will helpfully load the module for you and then run the thing and then return the response. So, I, with my test code when I was doing my research for this talk, I just wanted to know how far I could take this. So I decided to try this. So 
it just quite happily loads the OS module for you, <laughs> runs the system command, passes it that argument, and then did the same thing over here, and you just got a zero there, which isn't very exciting, but then the contents of my home directory became empty. <laughs> Are you one of those people who kind of writes your, your, your throwaway code just in your home directory? You don't often throw it into a subdirectory, or, or who's, who's better organized than me? Anyway, I, I had to rewrite my code after that. <laughs> and start over again. Luckily, it wasn't really too big. OK, so that's insane, right? It's that simple. YAML.load gives, gives the YAML full access to your system. Absolutely. Surely, this doesn't happen in real life. November 2011, uh, not Django itself, but the two biggest uh, REST frameworks used in Django, both of which were using YAML.load, and both of which were allowing anyone with access to the publicly published API full code exec privilege, blah, over, you know, game over, uh, through YAML.load, which is a little embarrassing, but was fixed reasonably fast. That was in November 2011. 13 months later, Ruby had the exact same problem. And this was in the news. Uh, Ruby developers here, Ruby on Rails developers in here, probably remember having a pretty bad month last January. Um, so that was a big deal. That was a major news story. There were hundreds of thousands of websites that <gasps> were potentially affected by that. And so they fixed it right away, and everything was good for a few weeks, until February 2013, when the exact same bug was somewhere else in the Ruby on Rails code base. I'm not really a Ruby developer. I think Ruby's a really cool language, but the syntax kind of bugs me. And so, I, I, as a Python developer, I laughed a little to myself. And then I started crying when it happened to Puppet. I trust those guys. I trust the Puppet guys to get it right. Same deal. It was using the Ruby YAML parser, and the Ruby YAML parser will happily instantiate Ruby objects, and those Ruby objects might be doing all kinds of things you didn't want them to do. Now, the Ruby parser actually, the Ruby YAML parser is a little bit less insane than the Python one. The Python one will happily load the module for you and run it, so you can just go straight to os.system or whatever you want. The Ruby one only instantiates objects that have already been imported into your Ruby environment. So to take advantage of these vulnerabilities, the, uh, if you were hacking Ruby on Rails, you had to go searching through the Ruby code base to find a module that was, or a class that was already loaded that you could then take advantage of. But there were a couple. If you just dug deep enough, they found one, and they were able to exploit it that way. Node.js. This one I kind of like because remote code execution vulnerability, and down the bottom line, strongly consider porting their code to use the new safe load method. So this was a thing that there actually wasn't any protection from until they noticed that this might possibly be a problem. There was no safe load method beforehand. So how do you protect yourself from these kinds of vulnerabilities in markup languages? Remember, they're not vulnerabilities, they're features. And the only way to protect yourself from them is to get rid of the feature. Make the parser stupider. To do that, you have to know that the parser does these things. Maybe you didn't realize it. Um, in Python, it's really simple. It's so simple. All you have to do is use yaml.safeload instead of yaml.load, and you're fine. It doesn't instantiate anything dangerous. It just uses the basic data types. It'll give you dictionaries, numbers, and strings, and that's probably it. Oh, lists. For Ruby, you have to download a third-party library. And the third-party library actually goes in and monkey patches the standard library Ruby YAML parser to make it safe, to, to offer you this option, safe equals true. Both of these are stupid because the safe thing to do should have been the default. Um, we're, we're, we're be developers and framework developers are learning now. And if you use Angular, for example, if you're binding HTML using Angular, it says things like, you know, bind this variable to Angular, uh, to your node, but if you want to bind it directly, it, you, you have to go bind unsafe, right? So they, they, make it, they make it the default, the safe one, and they make it really obvious when you're doing something that you probably shouldn't be doing or should think more carefully about. 
So the YAML library doesn't do that. The, the default one, the one you would go to first, dot load, is insane if it's not trusted input. If it is fully trusted input, then you're fine, but the problem is you put something in your, you put something in your library spec and you say, only use this for trusted input. Somebody won't. So it behooves you to protect them by making it the default to be safe. <clears throat> Let's move on to XML. How much time do I have left? Because XML is hilarious. <laughs> I was trying to think of something scary, like fun with XML or horrible things you can do with XML there, but actually just having XML alone on a slide like that probably scares enough people already. <laughs> okay. This is a really simple XML file. And who, everyone here has used XML. A lot of people have used XML a little bit because these days you don't end up using XML too often if you can avoid it. I am sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's my document. It's called foo, or it is a foo type document. I don't, I don't really remember the nomenclature properly, but it has this entity in it, and that just represents a Unicode character, and that Unicode character is a little smiley face. And if you write HTML, you're used to a million different entities because you use all the standard entities in HTML, and I think most of the same ones are defined in XML as default, but you can always fall back to a Unicode character or whatever and you can define documents which define new entities. So this is a piece of XML that consists of a little document and a document type definition there which just is inventing a new entity called Smiley. <coughs> and it's saying that this is the definition of that. And so now in my document I can put in ampersand Smiley there and I get my little Smiley face back out. The parser will just, it's, it's almost just a variable substitution. What's fun about it is that it can be recursive. So, my smiley is just one little character. And then I have a thing called S2, which is smiley, 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 smiley. Then I have a thing called S3, which is S2, 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 S2. And so I only have to put in my one thing there, and I get all of these smileys, and everybody's happy now, right? Everything's great. Um, this, is, this is a reasonably well-known old trick which every, every XML parser, if your parser is acting correctly, this is what it'll do, which is why it's really fun when you do something like this. Who's seen this before? Devdas has? Yep, enough of you have to, 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 with the smug grin on your face, yes, this has hurt me before. No, no, oh, yeah, you... I, I, I <laughs> Isn't that nice? You have to do this if you're a compliant XML parser. Now, well, that's, those are spoilers, so. Anyway, ignore that, man. Um, this is the billion laughs attack, and it will cause a memory blowout on every XML parser that is a correct compliant XML parser. Actually, this is the 168 million laugh attack because I wanted to squeeze it down to one slide. So I cut a few of the lulls out. So it's, yeah, 168 million. And funny story, my little, my little test web app, it never got that far. Because before I was able to send this to my little crappy test web app to watch it blow up, my laptop blew up and died. The reason my laptop blew up and died was because I was using a nice little text editor, which was parsing the XML <laughs> to make sure that it was valid. So if you're going to be copy and pasting the billion laughs attack around, be careful if you're using Emacs, because Emacs will look at it and go, oh, that's well formed, whoa, and blow up and die. OK, so that's a denial of service attack for free. If you access an XML, any XML API, that is just publicly available. Uh, I don't have a disclaimer slide. Pretend I have a disclaimer slide. Don't do this, please. Uh, don't just send that to a public XML API. Um, Ixne on, on getting me arrested. Um, you, can, you can crash. If they, if they haven't got a protection from that, you can just crash their, their web app. And which is, you know, that's not too dangerous. That's just crashing it. But still don't do it. Be good. But that's not the only thing you can do with entity expansion. Be 
because you can define something which is just you know that bit of text there, but you can define external entities. And this external entity is reading a file from the system, which, whichever system the parser is located on. Okay? Now, the XML parser is usually on your application server, because it's obviously part of your application, and the XML parser, if it's a compliant parser, will happily read any file it can read. Now, that one's not very harmful, but it could have been Etsy password. It probably can't be Etsy shadow, except I know that sometimes people run public XML API parsers as root. I know this has happened because certain people have told me crying over beer. <laughs> um, but the thing that is always readable by your API, by your app server, is the little configuration file that has things like your database password in it. Because the app server needs to know the database password, and you might be able to guess what its name is. <laughs> that might not be a bad idea. And of course, it can read its own source code as well, if it's an interpreted language. But it doesn't have to be local to the file. So here is an external entity that is defined as a URI. And it can be any kind of URI. And it's being accessed by a compliant XML parser from within your DMZ, because it's the application server, which is probably behind your firewall, or in your DMZ, at least. And it doesn't have to be HTTP. Although, if it, you, you might, it depends a little bit on the parser, what the parser will support. But it doesn't have to be port 80. So you can call it HTTP, and you can connect to port 110, and you can see if it takes a little while to time out, or if it causes a different kind of error. And you can do a full port scan of the internal DMZ with a bit of timing investigation and trying different ports and IP addresses with an external entity load. And yes, I know people who have done this. Which kind of, which kind of answers this question? Especially with enterprise systems, especially with corporate systems, it's dangerous and it happens a lot. And XML is full of features that if you're just using it for getting data from over here to over here, you need to be really, really aware of. And one of the reasons why people, one of the many reasons why people aren't a big fan of XML anymore is because to protect yourself from it, as this gentleman already said, you have to have a non, you have to have a non-compliant parser. Everyone here was always told if you use grep to read your XML, you're an idiot. If you use grep to read your HTML, you're an idiot. But if you use a compliant parser, you could be in even more trouble. To protect yourself from XML, don't allow DDDs, don't allow document type definitions, don't expand entities, don't resolve externals, limit the parse depth, limit the total input size, limit the parse time, use an iterative parser like SAX to try. You just wanted to read your data. You didn't want to have to go through all this stuff. And again, I mean, all of that comes down to the same principle as before. Your parser has to be stupid. You've got to make your parser stupid enough that it's not doing anything you didn't think it was, you didn't realize that it could do. And as, as he said earlier, in Python, there's finally a way to do this. This is a fairly recent occurrence. I think it was published in about March last year. Um, Diffused XML is basically now going to be the de facto standard way in Python of safely parsing untrusted XML. And it's, it's a good choke point to just make sure that if there, is, if there are more bugs in XML that, that they discover, at least you can trust that the Diffused XML guys will be onto it reasonably soon and, and get it updated. In other languages, um, from my part, you're on your own. I, I, don't know them I don't know them well enough. But any XML parser that is, by default, parsing valid XML is probably unsafe. You have to look at your XML parser and find out where it hides, because the documentation is always crap, where it hides the ability to turn off the things that you don't want it to be able to do. Or try to use something other than XML. Like JSON. JSON might actually be the answer to this. JSON is the now the most, probably the most popular, you know, trendy data serialization format. And that's basically because it actually is stupid enough to be safe. It only does numbers and strings and objects and lists. That's pretty much it. It doesn't even allow comments, right? There's, there's just not a lot to it. 
So JSON might actually be the safe option that you should use by default, but only if you use a stupid enough parser. Again, it's all down to parser features, right? And what's the one thing that JSON sells itself as that totally shoots all of this in the foot? <laughs> I think I heard that. <laughs> Eval is not a stupid enough parser. Even the guys, even the guys who invented JSON in my opinion, possibly didn't think of the consequences of making it a subset of JavaScript so that eval could parse JSON. That's not a subset of JavaScript. It's critical. There's the part of the exception. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you about that later. It, but, but it is something that can be parsed by eval by, in JavaScript. And not only that, here we are at w3schools.com. And... <laughs> As you can see, right here, it's a feature, not a bug, right? Since JSON syntax is a subset of JavaScript syntax, ha, there, see? <laughs> it's on W3Schools. <laughs> it's on W3Schools, it must be right. <laughs> the JavaScript function eval can be used to convert a JSON text into a JavaScript object. But that's W3Schools, we're, we're laughing at them. Here's JSON.org. What does it have to say? To convert JSON text into an object, you can use the eval function. Eval invokes the JavaScript compiler. Sin that's okay, we've already rubbed that in. <laughs> Proper subset of Java. The compiler will correctly parse the text and produce an object structure. Now, I will be a little bit fair because on both of these pages, somewhere down here on this one, it actually did say something along the lines of, oh, by the way, you should probably not do that. And on this one, it was a, a little bit higher up. It was a little below the screen there. But the same problem that with YAML load in Python. The unsafe suicidal option is the one that they teach you first. You've got to make your parser stupid enough to be safe. So the lesson is beware of flexibility. We use data interchange formats because importing the data into your program is the most boring part of your day as a developer. You want to do something with it. But you need some due diligence and you've just got to make sure that what you're doing doesn't have unforeseen features that will do more than you actually need. And if you do need them, maybe you should find a way of not needing them. And if you don't need them, disable them. Disable everything you possibly can that you are not using. Don't leave them enabled in case you might use them one day. If you have to use them, you can re-enable them. Keep it simple. Keep it stupid. Thank you very much for your time. Over while cool. we take some questions. Sure. So, are there any questions for Tom? Or are you too scared? No, no. Maybe I'll do it. How about um, Pearl's uh, new Pearl's uh, uh, files that we have the same kind of um, uh, values that um, So, the question was if Pearl has suffered from some of the same kinds of things. I didn't investigate Pearl much. But first of all, if it's, a, if it's a correct XML parser, then it's in the device. So because the features of XML are what makes it unsafe. The YAML Perl parser that I looked at was even scarier because it was written in C. And it had a whole lot of descriptive text on it saying, oh, and because it has these tags, YAML was perfectly safe and super fast. And I didn't, I didn't go in and actually investigate it. but. I was disconcerted by some of the descriptive text in the library's documentation. Another one? Yep. Yeah. Um, just a comment. Uh, so the, the issues you, you brought up with XML, I think there are a number of people in the community who feel that that's a problem with the XML spec itself. It, oh, it is. It is. These are all features of yes. the spec. Right. And so there's a number of people working on something called XML5. Uh -huh. um, that's a little more realistic. That's, that's an, I, I had never heard of that before. I wouldn't use it even if it came out just because JSON is something that is, you can hold it, you can hold the spec in your head. It's yeah, dumb. It's not good for everything, but it's good for No, it's, it's terrible, but it's also dumb. Um, Julian, I have a question for you. What was, what, what was your comment about it not being a subset? The two, there are two Unicode characters that are allowed in 
<laughs> Aladdin JSON code is not valid in JavaScript. So 2029. What are they? Putting a string in it will. Sorry, man. The official definition is line separator and paragraph separator. Cool. Okay, I didn't know that at all. You're generating a trivially escape. So just just two unique good characters. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So you need uh, to just. You said at the start of the talk that uh, Java serialization was absolutely horrible. Why why exactly is it horrible? And or is it just that it's Java? I, I mentioned okay, I mentioned I mentioned Java especially because out of the conversation I had with Adam Wallow when I was doing some research for this talk. Adam Lobo is the guy who runs KiwiCon. He's quite a prominent New Zealand hacker. And he does penetration, he does red team tests against enterprise systems all the time. And he walks all over Java, enterprise Java applications, and particularly Struts, which is a development framework for Java, I understand, which invented its own, which, it, which has its own serialization format. Um, and I can't give you all of the details. I don't remember the name of the serialization format. But you could do things like put system.out.println in the get parameter of your URL, and it would run it as Java, which is cool, right? Um, and that was because it was, and it's, it's, it's a subset of Java, but it's a subset of Java that actually has executable code in it. And they were, in the struts framework no, I won't say any more because I don't know enough and I might say the wrong thing. But it, the Struts framework has its own serialization format, which is plagued by too many features and can easily give you code execution. And on that note, I think we'll uh, finish up now. So everyone, please thank Tommy. Cool.